wonderful to be here with you. It's so great to see so many good friends, uh, people that I've come to know and love over the last several years. New Zealand, I've said to many people, uh, is not my home. Kansas City is my home. Uh, but New Zealand has become my spiritual home, and I say yes to anything that's asked of me uh, as it relates to New Zealand. I love to be here. Um, it's been a privilege to get to know the Presbyterian Church of New Zealand. I've had many opportunities, as Mark indicated, to uh, be among your community, and I finally feel like having, for the first time, been to Dunedin, I have finally ascended to the Holy Hill. <laughs> and I am very humbled and grateful to be here with you today. As Mark said, we planted a church, Jacob's Well, 15 years ago, and when we planted the church, we were looking for a space in a particular part of the community where much life wasn't happening. It was urban, but not inner city. It was creative and artistic. The population was in flux quite often, and we were looking for resources, and we had none our own, of our own to offer. We found a very generous community called Roanoke Presbyterian Church that had been founded at the turn of the last century and had built a building in 1930 and was there uh, just generously offering themselves and their space to us when it came time for us to plant. And so we coexisted with this lovely congregation of people for about three and a half years. Uh, we had an incredible relationship with them, and then as sometimes happens, a church leadership split happened, and the church just did not recover. And so we were able to purchase the building from that congregation, and from the denomination, for an incredibly generous price, pay cash, and we've lived there as our sole residence, as a community, for the last 15 years. It's home, and when we lost Roanoke as partners in ministry, we grieved it deeply. One of the things that I think made it easier for that community to close their doors was the sense that they were handing off a baton, the work that had been going on for a hundred years in that community, to another community that would then continue the work that they had done. And I would like to share with you some pictures that talk about the continuation between their ministry and ours. Uh, some of you who are here celebrating 50 years, that's incredible. I hope to someday be in a similar situation. Um, Roanoke was built in 1930, and this is the original uh, architectural drawing that was created when they were trying to raise money to build this building. This was the building as it was eventually conceived and erected, and this is it today. Uh, we've been looking at the different things that are going on there. This is what it would look like for people to enter and arrive at the church back in the 1940s. This is our community arriving at the same space today. This is their community greeting one another, blessing one another. This is ours, again, in the same space. The space is the same, the heart is the same, but some of the ways it gets expressed is very different. Here's the pastor preaching on Sunday. This is how we occupy the space for teaching. I love this picture of their worship leader. <laughs> and then ours. Them preparing to serve the body and blood of Christ through the Eucharistic communion. Does that look familiar to any of you? And what it looks like for our community. Kids ministry, or more properly, Sunday school in their day. That young man does not look quite happy to be there, does he? <laughs> and our children in the same exact space. Fellowship happening after church in the kitchen. This is my favorite comparison. And it happening for us. Guys in the kitchen this time. <laughs> And finally, blessing each other as we're being sent out into the world. In their day, and now in ours. We're at a place in our life as a church where the building that has served us so well for so long is no longer adequate to the needs we have, and yet we feel compelled and drawn to stay in that very community, to stay in that building. And so when I get back this next Sunday, we actually walked a public generosity project where we'll be raising close to four and a half million dollars over the next couple of years to try and build an additional space so our community continue to grow 
and to have hospitality and formation and engagement happening in the same way that it's been going on. What we've noticed in the life of our church is that every five years, we seem to have been called to take a move that's risky, to go in a new direction and to expand our life and our ministry together in significant ways. And as we were processing through that story, one of the older gentlemen in our church sitting there listening to us cast vision and ask them to prayerfully consider how they might participate both financially and as leaders raised his hand and he said, you know, I think about a time about 75 years ago when a group of people were similarly sitting in a room like this talking about developing space in order to offer hospitality to a community, to do formation in a way that would shape people to respond to and be transformed by the gospel and to figure out how they could engage their neighbors. And he said those people decided to take a risk to build a building at the height of the Great Depression. What kind of faith must have that generation had to be the kind of people that would take the kind of risk that they did, to do the kind of things that we did, that they did, and now here we are 75 years later, living off the generosity of a previous generation. He said, I wonder if we will be up to the task that they were. I wonder if we will be the same kind of people who will be willing to risk, to follow God, to do something that in 75 years another generation might bless us for having done. It was an appropriate and humbling challenge to hear from somebody in my church, and I felt like as the senior pastor, that should have been me saying that. But I was thrilled that somebody in our church had that vision and saw themselves thinking in those kinds of ways. I've been thinking a lot about space and risk. I wonder what propels, or better maybe compels, risk. Ambition? Presumption? Novelty? Boredom? Or maybe something else? I wonder about the question, does space matter? We are coming out of an era of modernity where we've been displaced or misplaced, where we've been told place doesn't matter, and yet there's a recovery of space and a recognition that space actually matters. One of the things we're up against in our congregation is that we were living in a building that was designed in a time when everybody walked to church. And so there was no need for there to be any space for hospitality. Why? Because you were in church with your neighbors. But most of my congregation drives from all over the city. And when worship finishes, there is no place to go. The rule in architecture today for the design of church is that for every square foot you have in worship, you have an equal amount of square footage for socializing and space to encounter one another. People are desperately lonely to connect and to be welcomed in and to be invited to be formed as people of Jesus. But when we talk about space, we also have to recognize that space is about more than just our physical environment. Space is about our location in an environment, yes, physical, but also emotional and spiritual and relational. And all those things have an incredible power to impact the way in which we encounter each other and the kinds of encounters we have when we're together in those spaces. And so today with you, I want to explore the intersection of space on one hand and love on the other. And to do so, I want to look at two passages from the Apostle Paul. The first from 2 Corinthians, the second from Ephesians. The first thing I want to explore is leadership and risk. And I want to reflect on the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul as he relates it in 2 Corinthians. You might know 2 Corinthians. In chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, Paul describes his ministry and the difficulty he is having being an ambassador for Christ. The reality of his suffering. It's a compelling passage where he talks about the temptation he has to lose heart. And why might he lose heart? Because of the reality of the suffering that he is experiencing as a minister of the gospel. He reminds us that the treasure is held in jars of clay. 
that we might know that this power that we have is from God and not from us. Hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. It's quite a litany. He says we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. He continues, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. So one bracket of Paul's leadership and the risk that he's taking as a minister of the gospel is framed by suffering. And then he jumps and we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and we hear the same kind of thing. Paul's hardships as a result of his ministry. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance and troubles, hardships, distresses, beatings, imprisonments, riots, hard work, sleepless nights, hunger, impurity, understanding, patience, kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in love. Paul's life is bracketed in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter 6 on both sides by his ministry and the suffering that he endures as a result of being an ambassador for Jesus Christ. But then in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we discover the beating heart of Paul's life and what propels and compels him to live in such a way that he would endure such hardship, why he would risk. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is about those two things, the ministry of reconciliation that he has been given and the hope that he has in the resurrection, given the reality of his suffering. Between those two things, resurrection and reconciliation, bracketed on either side of that between his hardship and his suffering, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, we see the beating heart of what drives Paul to risk. We know that in his previous life as a Pharisee and as a rabbi, Paul was compelled by the externals. Philippians 3, he tells the story of all his qualifications, his ambition that used to propel him into risk. But he gets to the point where he then says, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ. It's just, it's just a marvelous description of, what's, of where he's come to. And then uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the heart of it all for Paul. For Christ's love compels us. This is the beating heart of Paul's ministry. This is what empowers him on one hand to suffer to do the work of Christ and on the other to put his hope squarely in the resurrection. The love of Christ. It is the love of Christ that is compelling Paul into the behavior that calls him into a vulnerable place of leadership because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. What now compels Paul to be an ambassador of reconciliation, whose ministry subjects him to hardship and suffering, such that the only hope that he will claim for himself is the hope offered by the resurrection, is the love of Christ. Love in the kingdom of God is at the heart of risk. More than that, love is the beating heart of Paul's life and his ministry. And that is because Paul is a servant of the living God. And love is at the heart of God's purpose for creation. For whom Paul is an ambassador. For which Paul is risking everything. We know in the scriptures that we're told that Creation was fashioned in love and intended to be a manifestation and demonstration of God's love and goodness and that we, his creatures, were meant to participate with God in his life, stewarding the things with, to who, with, that we had been entrusted with. But we know the story, the story of the garden and the frustration of God's purposes. And so we then see in Genesis 12, 
God's purpose to get creation back on track by creating a people. A people who demonstrate, on one hand, what God is like to the rest of creation. But also, a people who enact His purposes on earth as His agents. And so we see the choosing, first of Israel, then the fulfillment of Israel, and the incarnation of Jesus Christ, and the fulfillment of the righteousness and faithfulness call of God's people. Finally, the church who become agents to work out what Christ has effected through his victory on the cross. So when we get to Ephesians, we see Paul describing how God is making a new people through Christ and in Christ. The division created by sin that we witness in Genesis chapter 11 is being healed. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is describing that healing by first describing the, the division that was there. He said, you were once not a people. You were Gentiles, and there were Jews, and you were separated from one another. Verse 14 says, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier that is the dividing wall of hostility. That division that had created and existed between us and humanity through Christ is being reconciled. God is reuniting his family on earth, and the church is the demonstration of that reality initially. He goes on to say, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners nor strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling by which God or in which God lives by his spirit. Paul's metaphor to describe the people that God has made, a temple. Paul says that the church, God's people, are now to understand themselves as a living temple. And a temple, we understand, is a place where the realm or sphere of heaven comes close and meets and merges with the realm of earth. N.T. Wright has been so instructive in describing these realities. He talks to us about the way in which the ancient Jewish mind would have seen really two spheres. One that would be described as the present age, an age of struggle and sin, and then the age that was to come. And while these were in some ways discreet, the Jews would have believed that in, in fact they actually overlapped in many different ways. And one place where the space between the present age and the age that was to come was, was a temple. A temple was a place where the age to come broke into, in all kinds of ways, the present age. And by which people living in the present age had access to the realities and things of God. Then Jesus comes, and we begin to see in the life and ministry of Christ that Jesus becomes a place, a thin space, actually the meeting of the age that is to come and the present age, where heaven and earth are meeting and merging and melding in ways that are significant, the cross being another testimony to the merging of these worlds that were formerly discreet. And now what Paul is saying in Ephesians is that God's people are a living temple. That we ourselves are a thin place. That in Christ, heaven and earth are coming together in us. And that in our communities, we are a space where these worlds are coming together to show what God is like and to enact God's purposes 
for the world, a living temple. And Paul wants the Ephesians to comprehend what God is doing and how they are connected to it. He wants them to see themselves as living temples. He wants them to see themselves as a location where heaven and earth are meeting and merging and melding. And so he prays. And he prays that they would know something very specific about who God is and as a result, who they are. Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What is Paul describing in this passage? A temple. Can you see it? In 1 Kings chapter 5 through 8, it describes the details of the temple, the preparation for it, the description of it, its dimensions, its construction, its furnishings, and the way it is to be dedicated. Paul here is describing a temple in many of the same way. The temple is a place where God's presence dwells. Verses 16 and 17, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being, the Holy of Holies. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. A temple is a place where God's presence dwells. And so Paul prays that they would be filled with the presence of Christ. A temple has foundations, which we see in the second half of verse 17. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, to be rooted is to be firmly fixed. Established is to have a foundation. And finally, in verses 18 and 19, we see the dimensions of God's temple. That you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And because the presence of Christ is both the foundation and the beating heart of this temple... And that presence means at the core of what it means to be his people is to be a people of love. We live at a time that if the church is going to survive, much less engage or even thrive, our communities are going to have to risk. But it must be risk that is not motivated by ambition, or presumption, or novelty, or boredom. Rather, it must be the same kind of risk that compelled Paul to live in such a way that he was willing to suffer and endure hardship to the degree that his main consolation was not success in this life, but resurrection for the next. Risk motivated by love. A love of God and a love of his neighbor. And if we take the context of Ephesians seriously, then the love of neighbor means precisely engaging those people that are the least difficult, least easy for us to love, as the Jews and Gentiles in his context would have been. The irony is, is I think that the church has largely gone silent on the one thing that formed the heart of Paul's motivation and hope. Our culture is desperate in its hunger for love, and yet there is enormous confusion all around us about what love is. Our popular imagination is filled with images and ideas about love, and it's romanticized and illustrated in art, poetry, and music, and yet even getting a sense of what it might be or what it might look like, much less in a Christocentric frame, is amazingly difficult to do. I think the church, I think we've rightly perceived this confusion, even named it, but instead of engaging it, 
we've largely gone silent about love. Or we've taken its cues, our cues from the culture and largely sentimentalized love. Here, more than anywhere else, we need truth. Which is to say, we need a transforming knowledge of the reality that empowers us to love and be loved. To know and participate in God's purposes to redeem and renew His creation in love with and through His people in Christ. I believe that love is a location. If love is a location, then the question for us is, what is our spiritual address? Where do you live? Do you live in fear? Do you live in doubt? Do you live in judgment? Do you live in condemnation? Or cynicism? Or indifference? Where do you live? Where do you make your home? Or as Jesus might have said in John 15... Where do you abide? I believe that many of us and many of our churches and an unsettling number of people live in fear, in doubt, in judgment, in condemnation, in cynicism, in indifference, which is why we often do not risk, and when we do, it is often motivated by ambition and presumption and novelty and boredom. Paul is praying that the Ephesians would live in Christ. That phrase, in Christ, Paul loves it. Over and over and over and over and over and over again, that prepositional phrase, in Christos, that you would know where you are and the implications of that location. Paul says we are to be in Christ, which is to say, in love. Not as a mere emotion, but as a location. You get the nerdy art part of me coming out here a little bit, is that okay? I think of us and the way we live our lives often as a sphere. I know this is a little bit hard to see. And that's not a flat sphere or a circle two-dimensionally. But it's one that has depth. And I believe we move around in our lives in these spheres. And I wonder what it would look like if we understood love as a location in which we live and move and have our being. And I wonder what would happen if we could actually see each other's spheres. Or perhaps our church's spheres. Where would our spiritual address be? I wonder if this is what most of the epistles in the New Testament and each of the seven letters to the churches in Revelation are. An assessment of the sphere that characterizes the life of that community. Paul wants the love of Christ to empower their lives, to compel their ministries, and to be their location. And that by living in that location, they would be empowered to join the work of love that the Father initiated with Israel, fulfilled in Christ, and then commissioned us to join in through the power of the Spirit. A love that would allow them to risk, endure hardship, embrace suffering, and participate in the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation that has to happen first between themselves and ourselves and God, then between others and God, through their testimony about the nature of the God who comes to be known and loved and reconciled with, and then between themselves and others. I believe the Spirit of God wants the same thing for us and for our communities 
And for this to happen, I believe we must ask some difficult questions and answer them truthfully. Where are we established? In what are we rooted? Here's how we might begin to answer some of those questions. Is our world getting bigger? Are we focused on those questions and concerns which animate the larger context with which we're to be engaged in mission? Are our communities and is our life characterized by faith and hope and love and generosity and hospitality and forgiveness? Or is our world collapsing inwardly, getting smaller, fixated on questions and concerns that are narrowly tribal in scope? and disengaged from the environment we share with our neighbors? Is it characterized by fear and doubt and territory and cynicism and condemnation or indifference? What kind of environment does our leadership and our structures create? What kind of environment does our leadership and our structures model? And what kind of environment does our leadership and our structures nurture? About a year and a half ago, I saw a brilliant commercial that I want to share with you in a minute. And it animates, illustrates a little bit what I'm talking about. So what you're going to see is about a minute long clip. And I don't want to spoil it, but let me just say that your initial reaction to it will not be pleasant. And then the, I think as it continues, you will grow in fondness for it, okay? So I'm going to play it, and then we'll talk about what we've just seen, okay? Oh, a little slide behind me. said there by Lufthansa, the footage is exactly the same. What's different is the soundtrack. When the soundtrack is discordant and atonal and clashing around you, everything that's happening outside the cab seems mildly threatening and ominous. The world is a dark and dangerous place, and you better not risk. In fact, staying in that cab is probably the best decision you could make, yeah? But then, the second piece, with the beautiful classical piece, it changes everything, doesn't it? You begin to notice harmony between what's happening outside as if it's almost choreographed. What seemed mildly threatening, dissonant, and unsafe now seems like it's moving with an intention and a direction that is significant. I wonder how we are training our clergy, our elders, and our people to see the world in which they live. I wonder what soundtrack plays beneath the narrative of our lives, personally and communally. Jesus provides a simple means to make such a determination. You shall know a tree by its fruit. Jesus says, if that we abide in him, 
we will produce much fruit. Notice the preposition again there. If we abide in Him. He also has unsettling words about being cut off and being pruned. And so leadership, location, and the reclamation of love. What are we compelled by? Where do we live? Leadership is about bearing witness to the reality of Christ. Dwelling, living, abiding in the right, most truthful location. I believe that means as leaders, we are men and women who are called and invited to live, dwell, abide in love. And that as we do, others will join us there or here. People whose lives and ministries, like the Apostle Paul's, are compelled by love and thus open to vulnerability, suffering, and the need for a hope anchored to something beyond this world. And as we live in that particular way, in that particular place, animated by that kind of Christ-like love, we will draw to ourselves and be drawn towards the same kinds of people who were first drawn to Jesus and then later to Paul and so many others. That's what the ministry of reconciliation is about. I believe that also means that we're called to develop space where such encounters can happen. Yes, physical environments that give shape to our life and our worship and our mission. But if such spaces are to be anything more than mere architecture, then they must also be vibrant emotional, relational, and spiritual locations animated and empowered by love. And to do that, we must first tend to the temple that we have become in Christ. Rooted, established, and exploring with everything we have the dimensions of love that characterize this new living temple. Truthfully, it's not easy. As Paul and Jesus' ministries and lives testify. But Paul says that this suffering is not just a burden, it's a privilege. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. How will we help young men and women called to know and serve the living Christ? How will we help them to fathom the depths of love that has pursued and chosen them? There are other places in our lives where we also need to ask such questions about the elders that lead our churches, about the systems that give shape to our life or that don't. But the cool thing that I see happening all around me is at a time when there is much confusion about the nature of love in our culture, there is a simultaneous growing awareness of the emotional, relational, and spiritual aspects of leadership, unfortunately modeled not in the church literature, but often in the secular business literature. Nevertheless, those resources are good. And so, thinking back to that generation of people that built the building that we've inherited in Kansas City, I wonder how our faith forebears might assess us today. I think it's interesting that I'm giving this address in a room filled with men and women who 50 years ago took that step and how they might assess who we are and what we're doing today. I'm certainly asking those questions at a time of transition and opportunity for my community, and I wonder about those in yours. But I even wonder, perhaps more important, not just about those who have come before us, but those who would come after us. Would we be living now and loving now in such a way that another generation might have a season to live off the fruit of our ministry while they themselves are being rooted and established in love? Would they be grateful for our contributions? I wonder what kinds of people were compelled to do the things that were instrumental in blessing and transforming so many and so much of their and our lives. And I wonder if they would ask us or ask themselves, what kind of training produced such men and women? We must know and reclaim love. In closing, I'd like to quote from C.S. Lewis. One of my favorite books, I read it every year, is his book, The Great Divorce. Some of you may have read The Great Divorce. 
It's a parable, an allegory about a bus ride that people who don't know that they're in hell but yet are take and they tour heaven. And the book describes various encounters that people touring heaven have with people who are there and pursuing God in the high country and yet who turn around and come back and engage them, trying to persuade them to let go of their attachments that they might experience life. One such encounter at the end of the book is between a woman and a man who had a very difficult marriage throughout life. And yet she has gone into the high country, become glorious, such that almost everybody is tempted to worship her. She has become so much her true self in the presence of Christ. He, on the other hand, has become such a shadow of a person that they give him a name called the Tragedian. And they have an interaction that our guide witnesses. It's a very powerful interaction, and I've never stopped thinking about it since I first read it. They're arguing about love. His limited understanding of it, her experience of it. Love, said the tragedian, striking his forehead with his hand. Then a few notes deeper, love. Do you know the meaning of the word? How should I not? Said the lady. I am in love. In love. Do you understand? Yes, now I love truly. And they banter back and forth. He goes after her, he goes after her, and finally she has enough. He says, you do not love me. He'd become thin in his voice, bat-like. He was now very difficult to see. I cannot love a lie, said the lady. I cannot love the thing which is not. Now this is it. I am in love, and out of it I will not go. Love is a location. Love is a location that when we are rooted and established in it, it changes everything. And it becomes the kind of energy and source that has historically, and even to this day, compels God's people to risk greatly for the sake of his kingdom. Amen.